Hey guys, it's Sam. Today we're going to talk about some different floor seam patterns that you'll see with some corneal gas permeable uh, lens fitting philosophies. Two of the most common lens fitting philosophies are going to be the lid attachment uh, contact lens fitting, or you could have the interpalpebral contact lens fitting. So before we go over that, I just want to talk about some basic terms that you'll need to know. When referring to the eye, you'll use the terms superior, which is like the top, or you could think of it as up, inferior or below, using the nose for a reference point as well as the ear. Then you could have medial, which is towards the midline, or you could have lateral, which is away from the midline. So those are some terms that you'll, you'll definitely want to know for your NCLE because um, they're used to describe a lot of different things. So like for example, we're talking about with lid attachment, you want the gas permeable lens to actually center uh, mildly superiorly, right? You want to center a little higher on the cornea so it's actually resting, you know, where it kind of tucks underneath the upper lid where interpalpebral would be inferior to that and it's going to center more so directly center on the cornea. So just some, some terms that you definitely want to familiarize yourself with. Okay, so let's talk about some basic um, fluorescein uh, things that you'll want to know. Well, first off, um, fluorescein is NaFl, that's sodium fluorescein, and it's a dye that's, you know, it's absorbed by the tear film. You're going to use a slit lamp with a low magnification. Um, you're going to use uh, a Rattan number 12 yellow filter with your slit lamp. You're going to use a cobalt blue filter for your light source. Um, this is going to make that fluorescein really vibrant and kind of pop. Uh, when you're observing the lens on the eye so you can see what you're looking at. So very important. Um, some basics about fluorescein patterns. Wherever the fluorescein is really vibrant, it's pooling in that zone and that's where it's steeper. So this lens, if it's, you know, if it's pooling in the center and where it's black, under the biomicroscope or really dark, that's where it's touching or it's bearing on the cornea. So there's, um, if you think this is much steeper, so this would be central pooling, this would be like a peripheral bearing or touch. And, you know, oppositely, if you have your contact lens, you know, you could have a central bearing. And, you know, with this, you would know that if it's, if it's bearing too much in the center, it means it's too flat, so you may want to steepen the lens. Um, you know, how else can you steepen a lens? You can increase the diameter size to it. You can increase your sagittal depth. So being able to understand some basics about fluorescein patterns will definitely help you um, to be a better contact lens fitter. So the first type of gas permeable fitting philosophy that we want to look at is apical clearance or the interpalpebral fit. And I'll write that down. Apical clearance, interpalpebral, interpalpebral. Okay. okay. So what you wanna know about this fitting philosophy is that you're gonna use a smaller diameter lens so you're going to want to use more in the 8 to 9 millimeter diameter corneal lens and you're going to fit these slightly steeper than K. So in general you're going to start about a half a doctor steeper than K. And remember, so our horizontal visible iris diameter is about 12 millimeters and that's this measurement here, but our vertical um, interpalpebral measurement is average about nine and a half millimeters or so. And that's why you want these lenses um, because they're interpalpebral, they're within this palpebral zone, they don't go under your, you know, upper lid, 
like a lid attached fit would. So you want them to center on the cornea. That's why you want them in that eight to nine millimeter size range for the diameter. Um, so these lenses are just designed to, to sit um, directly on the cornea. They'll still have to have movement with gas permeable lenses. It's acceptable. You want to have that two millimeters or so of movement with the blink action, but you want them to center on the cornea. So the fluorescein pattern with an apical clearance or interpalpebral fit, because these are fit um, slightly steeper than K, you're gonna have some central pooling, but you don't want excessive pooling. It's never good to have excessive pooling or um, excessive bearing on the contact lens. So you just want, you're in the central zone, you're gonna have a slightly more vibrant, um, pronounced fluorescein, and then you're gonna want consistent throughout the rest of the lens. You want a nice, lighter, even coat of fluorescein because when that fluorescein uh, gets absorbed into your tear film, it's gonna go um, under the lens and you're gonna see that tear exchange. And what's very important is that you have about a millimeter of a more vibrant, bright fluorescein for your edge clearance. Being able to see that um, will help you realize that it, it does have a good tear exchange, right? That's important for um, the purpose of making sure that your cornea receives nutrition properly. Because we don't want any dry zones, right? Because we don't want um, edema or swelling or you know hypoxia or things like that that you can run into if that, if that cornea isn't getting enough oxygen and if there's not enough movement. So again, your apical clearance or interpalpebral fit, these are smaller diameter, eight to nine millimeters. Um, you're gonna you're gonna fit them a little steeper than K. The way I remember this is you want them centered on the cornea. Steeper is tighter, so they're just like right there on the cornea. Steeper fit. Not that they don't move. It's just how I remember them. Um, remember this characteristic. So next, I want to talk about what is arguably the most prominent gas permeable um, fitting philosophy, and that would be a lid attached fit also known as corneal alignment. So I'm gonna write lid attached corneal alignment. So these lenses will actually center slightly superiorly to the cornea and they're gonna um, go under the upper lid, they're actually going to move with that uh, lid action. So when you blink, these lenses are gonna move. Um, so, and, and they're beneficial and people like this type of fit because it's a comfort thing. Um, you have less lid interaction because it's under the upper lid. So it's not very comfortable um, when, you're, when you feel the lens with the blinking me mechanism. So that's why the lid attached, it's, it's centered slightly higher and it's under that upper lid, so it's not, it's not touching the lens edge with the upper lid. Um, these lenses are a little larger diameter, right? Because we want them large enough. They're still encapsulated. Ooh, that was fancy. They're still on the corneal surface, right? They're not bridging the limbus or anything like that because, but they're gonna be more so in that nine and a half millimeter range, 9.2 to 9.6 as far as the diameter, uh, so a little bit larger. And oppositely from our apical clearance fit, our interpalpebral fit, these are going to be flatter than K. And you can remember that just because you want them to just think you just want them to move with the eyelid movement, just think looser. Um, these are fit flatter than K. So again, start. you might start with you know, half a diopter flatter than K on the, on the NCLE. You know, if it gives you a, a question and says it's fit flatter than K, remember it's flatter add plus to your final answer. And again, with the um, interpalpebral fit, if it says it's fit steeper than K, you know, steeper add minus to your final answer. Just a, a side note on that. But so with the fluorescein pattern on this type of contact lens fit, your corneal alignment, it's really, you just want a very consistent light fluorescein pattern throughout 
you don't want any excessive pooling anywhere and you definitely don't want any excessive bearing but you also need that about that one millimeter of edge clearance around the periphery and you want that to be very easy even throughout um, and sometimes if it's too thin you could have like a blanching which is where it's like too tight on the eye so you, you want it enough for a good tear exchange um, so that's that's very important but yeah so corneal alignment just think consistent it's aligned very smooth uh, representation so next I want to just talk about some very common um, patterns that you'll encounter uh, and you know sure to be a question on your NCLE and uh, side note is that um, if these videos are helpful um, go ahead and please subscribe to the channel I'm a little clumsy uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel I'd love for you to share it with your friends whether that's hey check out this video or you know tangibly on Facebook or, or some other social media platform um, I do appreciate that and comment and such I'll, I'll definitely attempt to respond to all comments um, so a very common pattern that you'll encounter is going to be with the rule astigmatism. So if you have a, a spherical gas permeable lens and you put that over an exaggerated with the rule cornea, remember with the rule is like a football laying on the side because we have our steep meridian in the vertical. So where it's steeper is where you'll see the pooling. So this is a very typical with the rule astigmatism pattern you'll get what they refer to as like the, the dumbbell effect. This is where, remember where it's black, where it's dark when you're viewing uh, these uh, fluorescein patterns, that's where it's touching the cornea, right? It's no good. Um, but you'll get this very typical dumbbell effect where it's with bearing on the cornea, but this would be with the rule. Again, we do not want any excessive pooling or bearing. And then conversely, or oppositely, you know, we can get against the rule. And against the rule, it's our steepest meridian is going to be in that horizontal 180. And the same type of thing, you'll get your, um, and this isn't excessively against the rule cornea, um, but you will get your um, bearing in the vertical meridian on this. And one thing that's really important to note is that a contact lens will always move or have a tendency to move along its steepest axis. This is why against the rule astigmatism is no good, nobody likes it, because it's going to want to move uh, medially and laterally in these directions. And, and that's just not beneficial, at least with the lid attachment or even the interpalpebral, we want it to move in the um, uh, vertical meridian. So this is going to affect your vision quite a bit if it's moving this way. So for this, we combat this type of astigmatism with uh, traditionally, I mean, you're going to use a bitoric lens because it puts a cylindrical surface on the ocular surface or your central posterior curves of the lens. Um, and what that's going to do is going to try, it's going to help keep it on the cornea, kind of like a reverse geometry. It's matching that astigmatism, so it doesn't allow it to move very well. Or you could use a back torque, right? By torque or back torque is going to have a cylindrical um, ocular posterior surface of the, corn, of the contact lens. A front torque lens would not be beneficial because it has a, a spherical back surface and it's just going to move all over the eye. So I hope that kind of helps to make sense with that. With the rule of astigmatism, you know, where it's going to be steeper, it's gonna, the floor seems going to kind of pop in the vertical meridian. That's going to want to move up and down. Not as big of a deal. Um, I do want to mention uh, very important around these topics. We have the myoflange or a lenticular myoflange or we can have a hyperflange. And this is kind of somewhat related to what we're talking about, um, but it's definitely noteworthy. A myoflange is, is, you can think of it as adding, it's adding thickness to the periphery of the lens, 
but it's like adding a minus lens to the to your contact. You can use it on high plus or um, on any lens that you need to increase the edge thickness to give more of a lid attached fit because the, the eyelid is gonna pick up on that extra thickness. Um, you can consider a myoflange. And the way you can remember this is, you know, if this is the contact lens, it's adding myoflange minus lens, right? So and you'd use it on a plus lens, but on a plus lens, you're adding a minus lens to increase the edge thickness. On like a high minus, you might, I mean, I'm sorry, a high plus, you might put a myoflange to make it act more like a minus lens in the periphery so that your lid has something to grab onto on that lens. Um, oppositely, if you have a high minus lens, and this is gonna be exaggerated, of course, but if that's your contact lens, you know, you could um, reduce that thickness with the hyperflange, it's gonna thin that lens. So just think of a hyperflange would be for a really high minus contact lens. Um, so they're gonna reduce the edge thickness and it's gonna allow that uh, lens to center properly. So myoflange is used on plus lenses, increasing that thickness. Hyperflange is used on minus lenses and it decreases the thickness. Um, with you know, with contact lenses and fluorescein, you know, the sodium fluorescein is used also outside of gas permeable lens fitting to evaluate the corneal health, right? So we're looking for things like punctate, staining, diffuse, coalescent, uh, patch. You know, I, when I mention those, I mention them in an order to where the, um, the staining is getting progressively worse. And there's different you know staining patterns like three o'clock and nine o'clock which is very typical and one we should probably mention on the so on the with the rule astigmatism that we mentioned with our classic barbell shape there You know, this is kind of exaggerated, but what if someone was fit with a lens like this and it had excessive bearing? Um, this is what we can call three o'clock and nine o'clock. So think of it like a clock. There's 12 o'clock, six o'clock. So your three o'clock and nine o'clock staining are very common and be very common with, with the rule um, astigmatism patients. And what happens is, you know, desiccation of the cornea it could dry out, you can get hypoxia or edema. Um, from this um, and you'll get these you know different punctate stainings and different patterns in these zones um, but something definitely to look out for three o'clock and nine o'clock staining you'll also see with people who have issues with their lids that may not close all the way is going to leave um, corneal staining with the fluorescein fluorescein um, has a, a tendency will um, be attracted to dead epithelial cells in the cornea so it's really helpful um, overall just to survey the health of the anterior or front surface of the eye. I hope this video was helpful just kind of going over some basics of some fluorescein patterns that you'll more than likely encounter or have to answer questions around on your NCLE examination. Again if it has been helpful like the video, share it, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.